Hello, I'm Scott Soshnick. And I'm Evan Novi Williams. And this is the Is That a Reebok Jacket? Sports Business Podcast, <laughs> the Sportacast. I love the underlying chuckle. And, and Evan, this is a super treat for me because it isn't every day where the worlds collide, where I can bring in old friends and our sports business and, and a topic that makes total sense right now, and that's collectibles. And by the way, Brian, and we're talking to Brian McIntyre, we'll tell you why we're talking to Brian McIntyre in a moment. But I do not. I'm not a collectibles guy. I didn't do the trading cards. I marvel at these people who have been buying ticket stubs forever. I don't keep anything from the events that I probably should have. You know, I, I don't. So first, why don't you tell us, Mr. McIntyre? And again, we'll get we'll get into how you 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 got to this this jacket that is for sale. But were you a collectibles guy back in the day? Not really, but I think I've uh, I inherited a pack rat. Uh, syndrome from my grandmother and my dad, people who grew up during the Depression. I just, there's some things I just don't throw out. Years ago, Bill Halls, a beat writer for the Detroit News, told me, he says, hey, look, well, I don't know what you're doing with your credentials, but put them in a box, save them. He says, you may want to, you know, make a bar in your basement someday, put them down there, laminate over it or do something. So I've got I've got credentials back to the beginning. And it's kind of funny. If you look at the evolution of the credentials back in the 70s and 80s, they were like two inches by four inches. I mean, you could have printed these things up in your basement and gotten in. As a matter of fact, when they first started using counterfeit credentials to get into the finals, a couple of them were much better looking than what we put out. <laughs> I can tell you, Brian. Uh, Evan, Brian had the original credential where it said, come see Dr. Naismith put up the peach basket. <laughs> I don't I don't want to date you too much, Brian, but w when did you start at, at the NBA? W what we uh, I was with the Bulls from 1978 to 1981, and then in November of 81, started up with the NBA. David Stern was uh, still number two. Larry O'Brien was the commissioner, but David was doing the hiring, and he hired me to run the PR department, and uh, I owe him... I own just about everything. I mean, Jonathan Fogler was the owner of the Bulls, gave me my first job. I'll never forgive him, forget him. Oh, maybe never forgive him either. Uh, <laughs> but uh, David opened up the uh, the keys, the, the doors to the world. And uh, just what a, me, what a great 30-year run. Give me what that is like. What is David Stern like? Uh, and, you know, I dealt with him plenty, but it's a different relationship. As an interviewer, what what were the questions like? Do you remember the things he wow. asked? Wow. It, it was a long time ago. We went over. I remember it, it lasted a couple of hours and it, it was good because we just kind of hit it off. Um, at one point, he said to me, he says, man, you're rather perspicacious. And I just <laughs> nodded. I just nodded my head. And as soon as I got out of the uh, the interview, uh, when I got home, I looked up the word to find out what the heck I was. So uh, <laughs> he was just he was very penetrating. He just. He was looking for someone who, as he told me later, who enjoyed working with the media. And that's, I did. I, I wanted to be a writer originally, uh, but never had the guts to leave Chicago and go out to the smaller places and pay my dues. So uh, I got lucky in getting the, the job with the NBA. By, by the way, Eben, I, Princeton degree notwithstanding, and, and Newhouse, perspicacious, having a ready insight into an understanding of things. I was planning to look it up after this interview. I just looked just it up. There Brian we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Evan, tell, tell everybody why we're talking to Brian. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating little business story, right? Both what happened back in 1992 and what's happening right now, Brian, with, with the auction. But uh, for folks who don't know, and, and, and maybe, Brian, it's better if you tell the story, but when, when the Dream Team, the, the, the U.S. basketball team, won the gold medal in 1992, there was a, a, a very monumental moment in sports business history where Michael Jordan – one of the stars of the team and, and a budding Nike superstar uh, was asked to go up and accept his medal wearing Reebok, the, the sponsor of the, of, of the jersey and the, uh, and the warm-up kit, and he didn't want to do it, right? And, and, and this, I think, there, there's so many lessons from this, but it is one of the earlier moments of, 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 of sports and business really clashing in such a huge way that I, at least I can remember. It was unique. Uh... I mean, those those of us who can remember the 1992 Dream Team, it just took the sporting world, uh, I mean, from zero to 90 miles an hour. And it really became the big story in the Olympics, just the fact 
that these 12 great athletes, 11 of whom are in the Hall of Fame, and Christian Leitner should be in for what he did in college. Uh, three coaches in the Hall of Fame, three or four, uh, Chuck Daly, Lenny Wilkins, Mike Krzyzewski. Uh, I think uh, yeah, th that's it for the coach. It was just a legendary group. And the, like you mentioned, Reebok had, had worked out the deal with the United States Olympic Committee to be the sponsor of the awards jackets for all, all the teams, not just the dream team, all sports. Uh, and the only time they wore them was at the medal ceremony. Uh, but this is when sports marketing was starting, not in its infancy by then, but it was in its maybe teens. And there was a lot of things to be worked out. You didn't really have prior to this loyalty from athletes to their, quote, brand. And the way Nike handled Michael was unique. And it was a true partnership. Long story short, he just didn't want to wear it. There were other Nike endorsers as well. They just weren't as vocal. I think they let Michael take the lead on this, uh, as he usually did. And by the way, that's a good idea. <laughs> yes, it is. Hide while someone else does all the dirty work. <laughs> and, and, uh, in this situation, but, is this Nike telling Michael, hey, by the way, we'd love it if you found some way to hide the Reebok logo when you go up there? Is this just you know, Michael knowing I have no, that this is valuable? Don't know. I really don't. That that would be a conversation between Michael and, and Nike. Uh, I just I know, but having worked with Michael all those years, he's extremely loyal, and so I, I don't doubt that it was his idea. Hey, look, Nike's my partner. I'm I'm backing them. They've backed me. They took me when I was quote nobody, uh, and he stayed with them. So you know you have to admire loyalty like that. That's not the misdirected loyalty that. Some former presidents wanted to have people do. That's this is true loyalty. And my wife just yelling at me, "Stay away from the politics." <laughs> Does she want to join us? It's fine because I, I I'd love to have her in your ear while you're trying to do this. So so Michael covers up the Reebok. He, I believe it was pinned, and then he put the American flag over over. You the know, logo. he didn't even need the flag, and I don't know who did the pinning. I sincerely doubt it was Michael himself. I'm sure somebody uh, in in his group was the one who put the pins together but the pins the original pins that were there when michael wore that to the award ceremony are still in there yeah and uh i didn't attempt to take them on anything i didn't even attempt to look at them that much uh i didn't want to mess with it but he didn't need the flag to be draped draped over it i think that was just an added theatrical touch and so how did how did the jacket end up in, in, in your possession? You're obviously there during the process and, and the jacket is for sale right now being auctioned off, which we'll get to, but how did it end up in, in your possession? Well, we were with the team quite a bit. We had worked with a lot of our players uh, over the years. This is 1992. I started with the NBA in 81. We had done a lot of, we had worked all the conference finals, the finals, the all-star games, the drafts, etc. cetera. Uh, international trips. So we, we had worked with most of the players on the dream team and we had, I think their respect and their confidence uh, that we wouldn't mislead them or we were, we were watching out for them as much as we were trying to get publicity. And they, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. So Michael takes the jacket off. I assume. He takes the jacket ask? off as, as he's coming off the court, after the medal ceremony, uh, and he's walking to the, into the locker room, we're out, right outside the locker room. I forget the exact conversation, but it was something like, you don't want that jacket, do you? And he <laughs> says, I, I certainly don't. And he took it off and tossed it to me. And, right, were, you, uh, were you cognizant, though, of this jacket's place in history, in sports business history, and a perceived value down the line? Or was it just a cool thing to have? No, it's just, I really, I'm not going to tell you exactly what was running through my mind between the end of the game and when he tossed it to me. But basically, I'm thinking, I really don't have any souvenirs from this. The, the players autograph some uh, items for us, for everybody in, in the traveling party, the coaches, the other players, the support staff, which wasn't all that many people. Uh, and I just thought, what the heck, you know? Maybe he doesn't want this thing, and it would be cool to have. I had no concept of what it would be worth. It didn't even enter into my mind. It's just that, hey, here's a piece of history 
that would be kind of cool. If he doesn't want it, I'll take it. And sure enough, he did. Um, I mean, I had a nice rapport with Michael. I worked with him uh, many years, all the finals. And uh, I think he trusted me. And in any event, it, he tossed it to me. I put it in my bag, kept it for a couple of years. I went to visit him in 1994. I had to go out to Phoenix for some NBA business. He was playing fall league baseball at the time. Uh, Jan Hubbard was with me. Uh, we went to see a game where he was playing. We heckled him from the left field stands <laughs> until he turned to us after about an inning of that and kind of gave us the, and so we stopped our heckling. Uh, but anyways, we hooked up with him, I think the next day, I, I wasn't sure if he'd want that back or not. Uh, but I said, Hey, would you mind autographing it? And he was very gracious. And he did, uh, you know, to Brian, thanks for everything, Michael Jordan. And, uh, and I took it home and just kept it basically under wraps. I'd take it out every so often, show it to somebody, uh, occasionally, a couple of times, put it on. Uh, oh, well, I, I, whoa, 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 whoa. There, there, look, there are green jackets that occasionally get worn, and I know why. <laughs> occasionally, athletes wear their championship rings, and that's, I mean, they're so gaudy that those are special, special occasion rings. Yeah. Come on. When, when do you flip on the Michael Jordan jacket? And uh, what's that occasion? Uh, is, it, is it the bar mitzvah down the Halloween road? Like, come on. Come on, Brian. When do you put it, that jacket usually, on? Usually at a family event when some okay. family member, whether immediate or distant, wanted to see it. So you'd bring it out. and That was it. When was the first time someone said to you, hey, Brian, what's that thing worth? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. It, it wasn't immediate, I can tell you that. But it, over the years, I think when sports collecting started to gain a, a foothold, when people started collecting shoes, and it probably wasn't that much long after uh, I got it. But uh, I, I do remember some of the other team PR directors finding out about this. And every so often, they'd send me an update from an auction that was happening somewhere <laughs> saying, man, I hope you still got that thing. You know, it should be worth something by now. And uh, recently with with the numbers they were throwing out and all the things coming up and and I'm getting up there in, in age and I've, I've heard of people who've had collectibles, uh, some of our former players, and they just say it's a lot easier to do it themselves. And instead of getting their kids involved in in sorting through all the estate issues and all that stuff. So taking care of it now. And to put these numbers in perspective, the, the jacket, the auction is ongoing right now at Sotheby's. The, the auction site says the estimate is that it sells for between one and three million dollars, which is not a uh, not an insignificant amount of money by any chance, by any sense. I'm Brian. I'm curious. This may be a dumb question. Did you call Michael before selling it? Was was it a thought to to, to run it by him just to let him know you were doing it, or well, yeah. did you just feel like jacket no. mine and I'm free to do what I want? One of the first things I when I when I really started to give some serious consideration to letting it go, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one of the first things I did was I, I contacted Jordan. I reached out to S.T. Portnoy, who is his business manager and longtime confidant. And uh, she got the word to Michael and he he would say he said it was great with it. He said, fine, I hope you hope you're successful with it. Uh, I have no interest in getting it back again. <laughs> I, I wanted him two <laughs> things. I wanted if, if he did had changed his mind, I, I, I'm not sure what I would have done. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you would have but, quoted him a very friendly price. Yeah. <laughs> but I also wanted him to hear it from me as opposed to reading about it in the paper or somebody else calling him up and say, hey, hey, you see what's happening here? I, I, I wanted him. He, he, he gave it to me. I wanted him to hear it from me that it was uh, going to go up in the auction. He, he had no problem with it. I'm amazed, though, when I watched, of course, now, like Ken Golden has been all over the place the past couple of months promoting his show. Uh, how did it get to Sotheby's? How did just the whole process get going? Who do you consult? How does it get there? Well, I'm not going to mention any names, but I did uh, reach out to a couple of different agencies on, on some other things that I had. Never heard back from them. <laughs> Uh, well, one in particular, never heard back from. Uh, well, let, really let me cool. let me check. Did did they know about? Obviously, um, they did not know about the Jordan jacket. These are just other items you had, and they're like, that's not worth our time. What I said was, I gave them my name, what I had done for a living. Oh, come that on. I had been with six Olympic teams. Oh no, and that I have some items that I think might be of interest to your oh. collect the collectors. 
And this one agency never got back. The head of the agency never contacted me back. Rem- so, remember, remember the scene in Pretty Woman where she goes back to the shop and says, you work on commission, right? Like, big mistake. Big, huge, huge mistake. Ay, 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 that hurts my ears. So I started looking up. I mean, by this time, I'm starting to think, okay, there's, a, there's an interest in this thing. Uh, and I saw that uh, going through the Internet, I, I saw where Sotheby's had sold a the Hand of God Diego Maradona jersey for like $10 million. And that report was followed by one that a Jordan jersey from the 1998 finals had gone for $10 million. So I thought to myself, who's behind this? This is the kind of reach you want, not thinking it's worth that kind of money. Um, and I came across the name of Bram Wachter at Sotheby's. So I sent him an email explaining who I was and that I had some items that I thought might be of interest to some collectors. And he got back to me within about four minutes. <laughs> and uh, Congratulations. Man, congratulations. Man, That's the lesson here. Answer no, the email. No kidding. Just, hey, if, if you're in that line of work and you don't investigate it, get out of that line of work. Boom. You know, just, you know, we talked about this earlier, Scott, care about what you do and give a darn, you know, and do your job. And so anyways, that's how I wound up with, with Sotheby's and they've been delightful to work with. They seem to know what they're doing and we'll see what, this is all house money. You know, it's, uh, I, 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 I still pinch myself. I'm, I, I can't believe it's worth those kind of dollars. I wonder how much this conversation will change moving forward now that there are so many people thinking about collectibles at every moment, right? The minute the World Series ends, Scott's brain is like, how much is that ball worth? Who's keeping and, it? The, well, the those balls are also, they're getting authenticated, right? It, it, You're getting hologram exactly. authentication stickers on it th- right away. I think one of the beauties yeah. of, of this story, Brian, is that I, the provenance of you getting this this thing is not like, oh, that's going to be worth a lot of money in, in, in 30 years. I need to get my hands on it. It was Back then, it was an afterthought about these things being collectibles at some point. Um, and, and at some point, we're just going to flood the market with this, right? If, if every jersey LeBron takes off, somebody is thinking about what value that is, there's going to be so many game-worn jerseys of LeBrons that come I out. Think they're already, I think there already are. You know, exactly. a lot of players for the bigger games, they switch their uniform at halftime. Exactly. It, it used to be because it was all wet or whatever, and you get dry and come out. Now I'm not so sure. Maybe some people do it to put it aside for here's one more thing that – is of value. And, and, you know, the players trade them back and forth with one another. They gift them as gifts to, to a lot of people. It isn't so much that the players are looking to make the money. It's the people who receive it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you saw this earlier this year, but fanatics started sewing into every baseball rookies Jersey, a, a chip essentially. And then after the rookie makes his baseball debut, they take the chip and they put it on a trading card. And the huh. idea is that like that's a really valuable trading card because it has the only the one of one chip that this rookie wore in his first game. And to me, that signifies that we're now manufacturing collectibles, right? It's not even just taking things off the field or taking a jersey off someone's back. We're putting something on the on the jersey that we can take it off after. I uh, think some of the trading story. cards started doing that over a decade ago where they would take a, a piece of a uniform mm-hmm. and put it into the card. And that was like the bonus card. And that was exactly. worth a lot of money when you got it. Yep. Uh, That's yeah, one of the things just, I learned in the Ken Golden documentary, the one of one LeBron. I, I, again, this is not my world, but it has a piece of the jersey from Cleveland, a piece of the jersey from Miami, and a piece of the jersey from the Lakers. And only one of those was created. And the world went bonkers when somebody opened the pack and got it. Huh. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. You know, who'd have thought all the tickets? And now, good luck getting tickets. You, you can get, <laughs> I guess because you they're all done digitally now, you can get a, what are they called? An NL, NFT. NFT. An, NFT of that ticket. Um, I went, oh, I went to the Big East, and it was digital. And they offered me the opportunity, or not, all I had to do was click, and I got a digital uh, copy of the ticket that I used. Interesting. I just I can't wrap my head around these NFTs. Uh, But but, you know, so now the tickets, if you have tickets, especially full length tickets that hadn't been, you know, cut in half for the ticket taker, uh, some of those are worth considerable monies now. It drives me 
drives me crazy though, Brian, for teams and leagues that are looking for revenue streams. Just offer the customer the chance to buy a paper ticket. Yeah. You don't I have think to do teams, it, offer it. Are they doing that now? I, this digital Some. thing that the Big East did where they sent you the NFT gratis, that was, I guess that served as a hard copy of your ticket. I guess that's the next best thing you can do. You know, economically, when the, when teams went to digital tickets, it saved all kinds of money, got them out quicker. There's all kinds of benefits to both the the teams and the consumers uh, by having digital tickets. But just having that hard piece of paper, as I mean, I've still got some half ticket stubs that I wrote on from Chicago Bears games or Chicago Black. I got one with Blackhawks. Bobby Hull scored three goals written on the top of the half stub. You know, they might be worth something to somebody. They're worth something to me because it was part of my youth. And I was a gigantic hockey fan growing up. And to have something where Bobby Hull scored three goals in a game that I was at, and here's proof of it, is was kind of cool. Especially you, want to know my, you want to know my first baseball game ever, and I did not keep the stub? Uh, I think you might recognize Game 6 of the 1977 World Series where oh, a guy wow. named Reggie Jackson hit three bombs. And my, my father says, well, I was at the game, but I didn't see anything. Every time Reggie hit the ball, I jumped up on his lap. <laughs> so, but we spoke about we spoke about that till the day he died. Like the, he didn't have the greatest memory there towards the end, but he never forgot that moment. And I have no idea where the ticket stubs are or the program or whatever. But I do have met the my little Instagram and Instagmatic camera, whatever it was. I have pictures of the scoreboard before the game. I have Reggie rounding second base and the confetti coming down. So uh, this is one of those, if I'm in the mindset of collectibles, I know Reggie. I could get him to sign that or whatever. Yeah, you know, but I'm not. That's not me. I was much like you. That's just not part of my thought process. Yeah, I, I remember uh, taking my son to Yankee Stadium to watch uh, Seaver pitch his 300th game uh, in Yankee Stadium. And again, we wrote right on the ticket, Tom Seaver's 300. My son has it somewhere, uh, unless one time we got broken into, and I think they stole a few things. That might have been one of them. Oh. Uh, but, you know, that's the kind of thing that you just can't, can't get anymore now, the tickets. I really hope that guy who broke in is listening to this podcast and was like, oh, my God, I saw that jacket. Yeah. I just thought it was a starter piece of junk. I just, I, I didn't, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, this I was, this that was jacket. pre-1992. Oh, okay. Forget it. Then, then no good. Then it, <laughs> the opportunity was not lost. By the what way, do you, do you know the tale here of uh, Carl Malone's wife in the locker room? Did you hear this? I don't know if I did. I love Kate. She's a great lady. Yeah, so and she's a smart one, too. Oh, yeah. All, all the players of the Dream Team took their jerseys off, and apparently they were all in a pile in the middle of the locker room. Guess who picked them up? Really? She's got – Carl has them all. Every single Dream Team jersey. Carl had them displayed at his auto dealership in Salt Lake, and they are now also for auction. Yeah, I know. Golden's doing that one. Yep. Uh, I, I – I also remember Carl was wheeling and dealing with other players to, you know, I'll trade you my shoes for yours. He was a big time collector long before uh, it took off. I think he, he'd been collecting jerseys for a long time. That, he's got a, quite a collection. So I'm guessing Carl never went for the 12th man. It was probably the, you know, the really good player on the other <laughs> team. I'm guessing Carl knew what to do. I, uh, uh, Un- unbelievable. I just uh, can you even think I, I'm just trying to go back. I, I forget about the purity of sport. I, I mean, that's ridiculous. But man, it was nothing like this. I mean, I started covering the NBA, I believe it was 98. Right. And by the way, you can tell the audience uh, how, how little did I know back then? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing. You became one of the best sports marketing writers in the country. You knew the business and it, you know, we've discussed this before. Sports marketing didn't really. I started with the Chicago Bulls in 1978, and the idea behind sports marketing then was open up your doors an hour and a half before the game and hope a lot of people come in. <laughs> we, I, I'm, I'm serious. I get we, it. we had. I was the director of marketing and media information for the Bulls, not because I was particularly adept at either discipline. It was strictly a cost saving measure for the owners to have one person do both jobs, which about half the NBA teams did in 1978. Um, 
sports marketing then was open up the doors, see how many people come in. Maybe we took out an ad. It was one column by about two or three inches. You had to look for it uh, to see it with tickets available tonight, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it really wasn't until oh, the mid 80s, late 80s, that sports marketing started to take off and became you know, a big part of sports. It, it, you know, you didn't have things like team boat at the NBA, which I think is one of the the greatest inventions that that David ever. Yeah, jumped for people out. who don't know, that's that's a department of the NBA for team and business operations. That's what team boat. Team marketing for. and business operations. Many of the people there, I mean, they study the marketplace. They know it inside out. Many of them go on to become team presidents or team marketing people. Uh, in, in not just in the NBA, but in sports around the world, uh, soccer, football, they're all over the place. I don't believe, I, if I'm not mistaken, the NFL didn't even have team marketing directors until long after the NBA did. Yeah, I, I want to say it was the late 80s or very early 90s that they started to have marketing directors at the teams. They didn't particularly need it. You know, they were getting sellouts almost every single game. Uh, although I go back long enough, and I think you maybe do, Scott. When I was a kid, I saw I snuck into the 1963 Bears championship game at Wrigley Field. After the game, which they won, there, there was no gigantic celebration. People left the, the 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 arena and celebrated and were cheering and stuff. We walked back to our car, got in the car, and went home. It, it just it wasn't as big as it is today. Was there a moment, Brian, in your, and maybe it was the Jordan jacket. Was there a moment that you realized, oh, the, the business side here is, 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 is becoming very powerful, that, that it is very much bleeding into the, the thing that has existed for, for decades in, in these leagues? It was before then. When I, when I started to work for David Stern in 1981, and it was evident in the meetings we had, even before he became commissioner in 84, that he had he had a vision, and he had – it wasn't just a vision. He had a plan. Uh, it wasn't written down on paper for a few years, but we just, he went, he would go after everything. He, I remember staff meetings where he'd run down things. He'd just get so excited. He'd be going all over the place and jump into this and jump into that. And then boom, our, we were supposed to follow up. And uh, it, it was interesting as all get out. He got, he and Rick Welts, who was our number one salesman and ran uh, NBA properties so well for so long. He, uh, at first, when they started going out and making calls, they were getting the doors slammed in their faces. No one wanted to deal with the NBA. And he, he showed, we put the anti-drug agreement together, got a new collective bargaining agreement that made the players and management, uh, in, in a sense, partners. And it took off. And it really was kind of a blueprint. A.H. Raskin, when we had that collective bargaining agreement in 83, uh, hailed it. He was a labor writer for the New York Times and hailed it as a, a model for all industries, where if you can get management and labor to be on the same page and act as partners, there's no holding back. There's no limit to what you can achieve. Am I yeah. correct that in the early 80s, NBA Finals games weren't even shown live on television? 79 yes. was, yeah, it was tape delay. Larry yeah. and Magic were tape delay. I think so. And, even in, and into the 80s, yes. Yeah. Uh, we only had, and regular season, we might have three or four games, period. That was it. Nobody, nobody wanted knew, us. Nobody knew Larry Bird was white in college. Nobody I, knew Larry Bird was white. I think a lot well, of I did. I, I'm from the Midwest, so we no, can see yeah, some yeah, of the games. Well, you're also perspicacious, so. <laughs> <laughs> Ding! <laughs> I've been waiting to bring that back. I've been waiting to bring that back. <laughs> that was well done. Well done. <laughs> well, speaking of well done, well done getting the jacket, well done holding on to the jacket, well done asking Michael multiple times if he wanted it back, and well done getting it to auction at the right time, Brian. There is this... There is this froth around collectibles, and because uh, you and I have known each other so long, and because you were always so gracious and helpful, man, I hope this thing, the, the estimate's three mil, and we all know, by the way, you're ha I know you'd be happy right now, but we all know the way these things go, that the last five minutes are going to be insane. You're going you're gonna to be watching, oh it. my lord. You're, yeah, I, I hope it goes three and four and five, wherever. I, I just hope... Uh, I just hope this thing goes crazy and that you remember that I have a 14-year-old that costs a lot of money. 
<laughs> Put your bid in early and often. As they used to say about Chicago voting, get in early and do it often. Yeah, right. I've been very fortunate to have been in the right place at the right time a number of times in my life, and this is just another one of them. I'm very grateful. Well, I'm the idiot. I've been in those locker rooms. I didn't take anything. I'm just an idiot. It's, this it, was given to me. I didn't take anything either. Th- that's Nobody that's gave me anything. Huh? That's nobody that's gave me. I didn't take all around, all around loser. He is Brian McIntyre, B. Mac, the other guy. Eben Novi Williams on the Twitter, Novi underscore Williams. I am Scott Soshnick on Twitter at Soshnick. Our producer is Matt Whitehurst. Thank you very much, Matt, who I don't think has anything Michael Jordan related. Digital media editor is Cora Veltman. She loves it when I remind you that the show can be found at Sportacast, which is the hub of the Sportical Media Network.